And joining us now here in studio, Mazir Bahari. He is the author of Then They Came For Me. He's a journalist and a filmmaker. And I guess I should start by saying, welcome back. Thank you. Toronto was home for you once upon a time. Once upon a time, And yes. I'm told you were one of the best waiters and bellhops they ever, or like, what did you do? You bust dishes. Yes. At I Bemelman's. was a busboy at Bebelman's. Yes. Bebelman's restaurant. Bebelman's on Blue, Blue Street, <laughs> Street and Bay. That's Bay and exactly Blue. Yes, right. Exactly. It hasn't yeah. been around for a while. Yeah. Maybe I, not because of me, I though. Was yes. Not just going to ask about me. that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're having fun here, Mazir, but of course, uh, one of the reasons you've come to be with us today is because you underwent. I guess about a year and a half ago, uh, a remarkably harrowing experience, and I want to start by talking to you about that. You're on the streets of Tehran reporting on the election, and you end up in Evin Prison, the most, I guess, one of the most notorious prisons in the world. Why did they arrest you? They arrested me because they wanted to scare members of the media in Iran, they wanted to scare journalists in Iran, and they wanted to scare filmmakers. And because I was a filmmaker and a journalist, they wanted to scare both groups through arresting one of them. And also, they, all, they had another plan for me. They wanted to incriminate certain reformists, people who are against the dictatorship of Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, through me. They forced me during my 118 days imprisonment to confess against those people. They were saying that if you just tell us who did you uh, put them in touch with, this person, they wanted me to name names and tell them and just lie and saying that I put this person in touch with the British Embassy or the American government, the CIA, Mossad, okay. whatever. Hold, hold off there because we're going to go into the interrogation in a second, but I'm all, I, I want you to tell people how they arrested you. They came to my mother's house. I was living in London, so whenever I visited Tehran, I stayed with my mother. The night before my arrest, the day before my arrest, I saw some of the most harrowing uh, scenes in my life. And I had worked in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Congo. So those scenes in Iran, they were really harrowing. What did you see? I saw the Revolutionary Guards brutalizing people. I saw the Revolutionary Guards kicking women through the windshields of their cars because they didn't want to touch them because they thought it was un-Islamic. I saw peop young people getting yanked out of their cars just because they honked their horn. And some of the really, really bloody scenes. And then when I went home th that night, I saw the scenes of the murder of Neda Agal Sultan the young woman who was killed in front of the cameras, and everyone saw that around the world. So I was really depressed. I was exhausted mentally and physically, and I took a bottle of smuggled illegal whiskey, and I poured two glasses of, two glasses this size, whiskey, and I went to sleep. So when they came for me on the 21st of June, around 7.45 uh, in the morning, I was really, I was deep asleep. And then I smelled something like rose water, a mixture of rose water and sweat. And then I woke up with the voice of my mother saying that uh, there are four gentlemen here. They are saying they are from the court. And then I saw my captor who became my interrogator. Your mother offered to make them tea as they arrested you. Mm. Why? Well, you know, Iranians are very hospitable and my mother saw them, you know, just ransacking the house, and she thought that, you know, she should offer them tea as a, a gesture of hospitality. But their, answers were, their answer was funny because uh, they said that, no, thank you, ma'am, we don't want to impose. And my mother has a really great sense of humor. She said, oh, you don't want to impose. You came to my house at 7.30 in the morning. You're ransacking my house. You're arresting my son. You're taking him away. You don't tell me who you are. You're not telling me who, where are you taking him? And you don't want to impose, oh, okay, thank you very much. So we don't have to have tea. And then they got a little bit pissed and they asked my mother, uh, pissed off, and they said that, ma'am, you should wear your uh, scarf. Because, and my mother was like, well, I'm 84 years old. Why should I wear my scarf? So I said, please, please just let them ransack the house and don't argue with them. Yeah. They stuff you in a car, they blindfold you, they take you to this place. Evan Prison. Did you know you were going to Evan Prison? No. You didn't know. 
I realized it because of the direction the car was going, that you know, it was going north, and most of the political prisoners and journalists, they, are, they end up in Evin. Did so they tell you why you were being arrested? They didn't tell no. me anything. They didn't tell me who they are. They didn't tell me my charges. They didn't tell me anything. They just had a arrest warrant on a faded photocopy that I realized later on that it was used for 300 or 400 more, uh, other people. So they just took me there. And then uh, within a few moments after we arrived in Evin, they told me that, Mr. Bahari, you're charged with espionage. We know that you're working for four different uh, spying agencies, American CIA, British MI6, Israeli Mossad, and Newsweek. And I said, <laughs> Newsweek magazine. And they said, yes, your quote-unquote magazine is part of the intelligence apparatus. And that was the beginning of a downward spiral that went from ridiculous to absurd oh, no, to it macabre. Got worse. It yeah, got better. It just, no, just, no, never mind Newsweek. You were a spy on behalf of The Daily Show on Comedy Central. Yeah, well, it was really absurd. And it was just No, no, tell that story. Because people yeah, yeah. think I'm making mm, that up. No, 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 you're not making that up. Before uh, the election in Iran, about a couple of weeks before the election, Jason, uh, Jason Jones from The Daily Show, who is Canadian actually, from Hamilton, he came to Iran and he pretended to be a, a spy. So he dressed like a spy, he had uh, sunglasses, he had a keffiyeh, and he called me Agent Pistachio. So uh, we had that interview, it was fun, you know, and I said certain things in that interview. And then, because the charges against me were fabricated, they had to fabricate evidence as well. So they, in order to bring evidence forward, they said that you, you were talking to this spy. And I was like, it's a, it's a comedy show. I mean, I, I hope you're not serious. And they were like, so why did you talk to him? Why, what's so funny about it? I said, never mind if it's funny or not. Maybe it's stupid, maybe it's not funny, but it's a comedy show. And they were like, no, we know uh, that you're, you've been spying for the agencies. And then, you know, they told me that, uh, because they looked at my Facebook, they said that you're in touch with Anton Chekhov, because I was a member of the Anton Chekhov, the Russian playwrights fan club on Facebook. They said, who is this Anton Chekhov? I said, he's a Russian playwright. Was he a Jew? I said, I really don't know. I don't think he was Jewish, but I don't think, uh, maybe he was, I don't know. And we're like, no, no, we're sure that Anton Chekhov, he sounds like a Zionist, we're going to investigate mm. him. I'd love to know the result of their investigation on Anton Chekhov. So. Well, this would all be laughable if not for the fact that you got yourself beaten up pretty badly while you were in there. What did they do? I was in solitary confinement for 107 days out of the 118 days I spent uh, in prison. And during that time, I was interrogated. I was, of course, beaten, punched slapped, kicked, and things like that. But the worst part of solitary confinement is solitary confinement. It's the worst kind of torture. And sometimes when I tell people I was in solitary confinement for 107 days, and when they ask me, so were you also tortured? It sounds bizarre to me, because it's like if you ask someone who has cancer, so do you have any other illnesses? Do you have heartburn? You know, it's, it's not like that. Hundred, people are human beings are social animals. They need to have contact with other human beings. They need to talk to human beings. They need to touch human beings. And solitary confinement was the worst part of the torture for me. So would it be fair to say this guy you called Mr. Rosewater, Rosewater right? Yeah. Because of the way he smelled. You didn't know his real name. Uh, fair to say that at some point you almost appreciated when he showed up, even though you knew it meant a beating because at least it was human contact? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I craved his beatings because I wanted to have some sort of human contact, some sort of connection with another human being. Because, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's impossible for someone who has not experienced the solitary confinement to describe how difficult it is. Just imagine yourself in a room for one hour. And if you, have to, if you want to go to the bathroom, you have to ask uh, someone to open the door. If you want to eat something, you have to ask people to open the door. You don't have any books. You don't have anything in the room to busy to be busy with and it was just the most horrifying experience the solitary confinement how'd you get out i had a i have an amazing wife and i had amazing employers i had newsweek magazine and i had washington post which used to own newsweek at the time and they they had the most amazing campaign for me and they got 
all the media in the world involved, all the diplomatic, uh, they use all their diplomatic connections. And because of that pressure, I was released finally. And I remember exactly when I realized uh, that there was a campaign for me because I was in solitary confinement and my only contact with the rest of the world was either, either my prison wardens or my interrogator. And the prison wardens were not supposed to talk to me. They were just supposed to give me the food or take me to the bathroom, and that was it. So one day, one of the prison wardens, uh, who I, was, I became uh, kind of friendly with, he called me Mr. Hillary Clinton. Right. And it was amazing, because there and then I realized that there was, a, there was an international campaign for me. Because I'm a Canadian. I'm not an American. And other, if there was not an international campaign, the Secretary of the State of the United States would not be talking about me. So that was maybe the best day of my imprisonment. Do you know if Canadian authorities had anything to do with your getting out? I'm sure they did. I mean, the Canadian government is more low-key in terms of its campaigning. I think that's the Canadian style. And they, in terms of their power, internationally, they are not as powerful as the United States. But I know for a fact that both the Canadian government and the Canadian opposition uh, they were very much involved in the campaign. You know, of course, of Zara Kazemi, who's Canadian-Iranian and never got out. Yeah, she got sure. a name, beat her to yeah, death yeah. in there. Okay, let's talk, uh, Mazir, if we can, some uh, Iranian politics right now. You've got two uh, fascinating leaders in Iran right now, Ayatollah Khamenei and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who are, I guess, once upon a time were allies, and now they're butting heads. Why are they butting heads these days? I think they're fascinating if you call cancer and leprosy fascinating well, diseases, you know. But yeah. that's, that's, yeah, that's a you know different what I mean. point. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> there are, yeah, I mean, but uh, as an observer of political, uh, political situation, or there are, it's fascinating to observe them. Uh, what is happening is that in 2005, when Ahmadinejad was elected, Khamenei supported Ahmadinejad to be his president. You know that in Iran, the supreme leader is the leader of the country. He has, according to the Iranian constitution, maybe between 75 to 80 percent of the available power in the country. He's in charge of the uh, foreign relations, the courts, the army, everything. Religion, mosque and state. Yes, mosque and state. And the president is, in fact, is like a prime minister in many monarchies. So uh, Khamenei wanted an obsequious slave. And because of Ahmadinejad's pretension that he was that slave, Khamenei supported Ahmadinejad. But four years later, after Ahmadinejad's re-election, four years after Ahmadinejad used all the resources in the country and started to have his network of officials all around the country, he became his own man. And then Many people realized that Ahmadinejad not only became his own man, but also his member of this mafia-like cult. They have their own beliefs. They have their own organization. And they are now undermining the clerical establishment. In terms of their ideology, the simple way to explain it is that in Shiism, most Shias believe that in order to follow the teachings of the Quran, and Islamic teachings, they need grand ayatollahs, who they call objects of emulations. And they follow the teachings of that ayatollah in order to be good Muslims. And then in order for the return of the Shia Messiah, the 12th Imam. What Ahmadinejad and his gang believe in is that they don't need those grand ayatollahs. They're telling people that they can just follow the teachings of the Quran themselves and they can be in touch with the 12th Imam, the Shia Messiah themselves. It's very similar to the Protestant belief and the Catholicism, that they don't think that the church is really necessary. So that they are not, at, right now, they're not attacking Khamenei as a person, as a leader. But what they're undermining, the authority, his authority, they are undermining the institution that gives him power. So there's been this rupture. Do you think that an Ah Ahmadinejad's got, what, two years left to go in his term? Will he serve it out? I would not be surprised if he didn't finish his term. 
Ahmadinejad wrote a very scathing letter to the uh, parliament who overruled some of his decisions. And some parliamentarians, they answered him harshly and they told him, please don't rock the boat, otherwise we will react How would they get harshly as well. They, he can be impeached. And also, uh, the first president of Iran after the revolution, he was just uh, dismissed by the supreme leader at that time, Ayatollah uh, Khomeini. Mm. So it's very uh, easy for Ayatollah Khomeini to do that, but it will be a big defeat for him at the same time because he supported Ahmadinejad. He basically uh, lost all his credibility as a leader, the little credibility he had, because of the support he gave to Ahmadinejad. Okay. Let's, in our last few minutes here, talk about the Green Revolution two years later, because I, I know there were a lot of people who were very hopeful that the election a couple of years ago was going to portend something bigger. But it didn't. What's the status of the Green Movement today? Well, I think the main problem was that many foreign observers called it a Green Revolution. That Green Movement was not supposed to be a revolution. It was not supposed to topple the government. The Green Movement started as a protest against Ahmadinejad's re-election and as a, pro as a movement in support of the reformist candidate. But then, when the crackdown started and when Ayatollah Khamenei blessed the Revolutionary Guards to crack down people and brutalize people, the Green Movement changed and it's now a movement for a more accountable government and for the end to Khamenei's uh, despotism. So the Green Movement is, is still going on. The manifestation of the Green Movement, one of the manifestations of Green Movement, which is uh, street demonstrations, that is not happening because of the government crackdown. But the Green Movement is actually expanding because the people are becoming more disenchanted with the government, with the regime, with Ayatollah Khamenei's regime. And the, all the ingredients that you see in other countries where the dictators were toppled exist in Iran. The high inflation, high unemployment rate, a disenchanted uh, population. Lack of political power. Lack of political power. And there's no venue for the citizens to express themselves. Well, I know Iran is not an Arab country in the way that Egypt or Tunisia or Bahrain or Jordan, Syria, it's happening in a lot of these places. But it is happening in a lot of these places. It doesn't seem to be happening in Iran. It will happen in Iran, I'm, I'm sure, within the next few years. And it is not happening in Iran because of two uh, main reasons. One is that Iranians experienced a revolution 32 years ago. Right and they are still paying for the consequences of the, the revolution, and they are suffering from the consequences of the revolution, and they are reminded every day that the revolution happened 32 years ago. So the memory of the revolution and a radical change is fresh in their mind. It's not the same in other countries. And also, unlike other leaders in the region, Khamenei has been very careful about his image. He has portrayed himself as a clean leader as a religious and a pious leader who is beyond corruption, who is ruling the country in a sea of corruption. And he's duped some people to believe that he is a clean leader. And those people around him who act like a cult, they are willing to die for him, but they're also willing to kill for him. Hmm. And if he's not the same, he's not in the same situation as Mubarak in Egypt or Ben Ali in Tunisia. Mazir, let me just ask you one last thing in our last 30 seconds. Uh, do you have lingering effects from your torture? Um, of course, of course. I mean, I would be lying if I said I didn't, but by doing interviews like this, by writing the book, by talking about other people who are going through the same situation as I did, and unfortunately they do not have the international profile that I have, I am overcoming that. I mean. I have those lingering effects when people like you ask me the question, but I sleep uh, happily at night, yeah. With a beautiful two-year-old daughter as well. Yes. Who yes. was born the day you got out of prison. No, six days after. Six days yeah, after. Yeah. After I arrived in London, yeah. Isn't that nice? We wish you well, and thanks Thank for visiting us here at TVO tonight. Yeah. Thanks very much. Nice to be here.